Testing. 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 Testing, still not live. Testing, now I'm live. We're live. All right, perfect. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. We got another paper for you guys today. This is a uh, little bit of a short paper, actually. I scrolled through this and it's actually only a couple pages long, so might be a short one today. This is called Common Diffusion Noise Schedule and Sample Steps Are Flawed. So kind of a uh, clickbait title that says that diffusion is flawed and that there's a couple different problems with the way that most people implement diffusion. This is 15th of May, 2023, so relatively recent work here and coming out of ByteDance Inc. So ByteDance is the parent company of TikTok, I'm pretty sure. ByteDance is a Chinese technology company uh, it owns TikTok, Douyin, and Toutiao. Okay, so basically kind of like a Facebook situation, but probably more intense. I think that just because China is a larger country and they have the whole 996 work culture in general, I'm pretty sure these people are probably incredibly intelligent and also incredibly hardworking, so... <laughs> Uh, probably more than their uh, big tech counterparts in America for sure. Uh, all right, so let's see what they have to say. We discover that common diffusion noise schedules do not enforce the last time step to have zero signal to noise ratio. Okay, so the way that diffusion models work is that they use a bunch of time steps in order to iteratively remove noise. Let's find, I like this picture. Or actually, even better, I like this picture. So, this blog is also pretty good, by the way. Lillian Wang blog. But what diffusion models are doing is they're basically removing noise step by step. So there's this notion of a time step, right? So whenever they say here, have zero signal to noise ratio in the last time step. What they are trying to say is that that very last time step, usually denoted by a capital T, right? You have capital T time steps and they go from zero to capital T. This last time step uh, Actually, let's keep reading. I think they literally define it uh, further here. And some implementations of diffusion samples do not start from the last time step. Such designs are flawed and do not reflect the fact that the model is given pure Gaussian noise at inference, creating a discrepancy between training and inference. So whenever you're training, you start from an image that you already know, you add noise to it, and then since you know what the image is because it's training and you know exactly what this image is supposed to be, you know what that uh, noise uh, is getting rid of, right? So you know the, the ground truth difference between the pure image and the image with the noise on it. And you basically keep adding noise. But whenever you're performing inference and you're saying, hey, I want to generate a completely new image, right? Inference is whenever you're actually using a model for its intended purpose, which is a separate stage than training. You're starting from pure Gaussian noise. And I think what they're trying to say here in this paper is that there's kind of a fundamental difference there where during training, you keep adding Gaussian noise to this image that you already know. And there's kind of this, uh, you're not getting to a pure Gaussian noise here, right? The actual final time step is not pure Gaussian noise, it's in some way kind of like dependent on this whole chain of adding Gaussian noise to an already existing image. But whenever you're performing inference with most of these models, you are starting from a pure Gaussian noise. And that mismatch is going to, is effectively like a out of distribution example, right? Your, any kind of deep learning model is gonna perform best when it's interpolating within the distribution of the data that it's been trained on, right? If you're training a dog-cat classifier, it's not going to perform well on images of zebras. So what they're saying here is that you can't 
be using a diffusion model like this uh, with pure Gaussian noise at inference when you don't have pure Gaussian noise in training, right? So this discrepancy between training and inference is kind of like an out of distribution situation. We show that the flawed design causes real problems in existing implementations. In stable diffusion, it severely limits the model to only generate images with medium brightness and prevents it from generating very bright and dark samples. Okay, so I think this is what they're trying to show in this figure here, which is because of this flawed noise schedule and the schedule here, noise schedule refers to the uh, exact way that you add noise. So you're not just adding Gaussian noise the same way every single step. Generally, the noise is added according to some schedule where you can get super fancy with it, but generally uh, at the very beginning, you add slightly less noise and towards the end, you add slightly more noise, but basically the shape and the nature of the noise that gets added is dependent on the time step, right? So that's the noise schedule. So the flawed noise schedule, they're referring to their uh, intuition here that at the very end it shouldn't or it should try to be pure Gaussian noise uh, and sample steps which severely limit the generated images to have plain medium brightness after correcting the flaws the model is able to generate much darker and more cinematic cinem cinematic images for prompt our fix allows the model to generate a full range of brightness okay so it seems like what they're trying to say here is that because of this uh, issue with the last step not having uh, the proper noise, you end up with images that are kind of medium brightness. And I think what they're showing us here is, so this is like four images that are generated with normal st stable diffusion. And you can see how there does seem to be this kind of like, kind of like a whitewash effect, you know, where it's like, it's kind of all the same brightness versus after you use their fix that they're gonna present in this paper, you get a much more kind of uh, cinematic look, they call it, where you have kind of very dark darks and very bright uh, brights, right? And I think this is actually usually the case in most uh, movies and video games are like this as well, right? They have very, very dark darks and very bright uh, brights. So like that kind of like cinematic look is basically, they're saying it's not achievable with stable diffusion right now because of this uh, flawed noise schedule. We propose a few, seems quite surprising, authors of previous methods would overlook this. There must be some subtleties looking forward to this one. Uh, not necessarily. I've, I feel like I've seen this before where basically a, a Western group of, of researchers releases a paper and then a Chinese group of researchers says, hey, by the way, you made this like one mistake over here in math. So the I just feel like the the intensity of like these Chinese tech companies is is just a step above the intensity of the kind of western tech companies and like the 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 level of math and the level of kind of scientific rigor is just higher at these Chinese tech companies just because of the way that you have more people you have more of a cultural emphasis on education that just the competitiveness and the amount of people in the 996 kind of work culture, all of those feed together to where just like the, the, the execution and ex excellence of like Chinese papers is, you know, it's, it's there's definitely a, a step function there. So I have seen this kind of pattern before where random group in a ch from a Chinese tech company or a Chinese university figures out, hey, by the way, this random thing over here, it was actually wrong and you actually need to fix it this way. Um, we propose a few simple fixes. Rescale the noise schedule to enforce zero terminal SNR. So SNR is just a signal to noise ratio. Uh, and then zero terminal SNR, they're talking about the, the signal to noise ratio at the very end, right? So right at the end of this, right here, whenever the image is pure, quote unquote, Gaussian noise. Uh, train the model with V prediction. I don't know what V prediction is. Let's see. What is V prediction in the context of diffusion models? 
are they talking about the schedulers like DDP, DPM++ or KEuler? So probably if you're if by scheduler you mean the noise scheduler then yeah it's basically so i think it's probably not the scheduler specifically it's like the terminal point of the schedulers right so the behavior of the schedulers on the very last time step not necessarily the fact that the whole schedule is incorrect uh, v prediction is a type of loss objective in diffusion models as it is used to train the model to predict the next frame in the video sequence. The loss is calculated as the difference between the predicted frame and the ground truth frame. Okay, so V prediction is just the difference between ground truth and real frame? Is this just literally L1 loss, but just with a different name? Let's see. V prediction refers to the prediction of diffusion potential or drift in the model commonly used in various fields drift rate how is drift rate different than a l1 or l2 loss so i'm i'm using both bard and uh gpt here cuz like one one thing i've kind of realized over time is that the hallucinations for this can be like a little bit insidious, insid insidious, and you can't, and sometimes you can't see them coming. So, like by having two different LLMs, and you kind of give the same question to two different LLMs, you can always kind of second guess or or, or check your own work, you know, because the probability that both of these LLMs hallucinate in the same exact way is basically impossible. So. Uh, both metrics, however, they measure. Drift rate is a measure of how the model's predictions change over time. L1s are a measure of the error between the model prediction and the ground truth data. Okay, so drift rate is more like a velocity kind of, yeah. Drift rate and L1, different concepts. Okay. All right. But V prediction. Step number three, change the sampler to always start from the last time step. Okay, so this is the actual sampler is what actually uh, gives you the noise. Rescale classifier free guidance to prevent overexposure. Okay, so classifier free guidance is this concept where any time, whenever you, uh, take a single step in diffusion, usually you're conditioning on some uh, vector, right? You're conditioning on some vector that's usually called the guidance vector, right? And it's either the encoded text or maybe it's a, a, a class, you know, like a cat, like a class vector that represents cat or something like that. Some kind of semantic concept in embedding vector form. And you're usually conditioning the noise removal on that vector. And there's this trick that people have done where basically they uh, condition with and without that vector and then the different, and you can basically scale between those. And that allows you to kind of like have a little slider in terms of how much you want this semantic concept to uh, be important. So see if I can find a good image for that. Classifier free guidance, mm, this image. I think this image maybe. No. There's one good image that I remember with a cat, but. Okay. I'm probably not going to find the image. But these four steps are what they're going to talk about in this paper. These simple changes ensure the diffusion process is congruent between training and inference and allow the model to generate samples more faithful to the original data distribution. So, right, the whole point here is that you want to have the distribution of generated images to be as similar to the distribution of original images as possible, right? Because deep learning models are much better at interpolating within the data distribution than extrapolating from the data distribution, right? generalization performance for any kind of deep learning model is better within the bounds of the data distribution it was trained on, right? And that's kind of where the whole uh, field of transfer learning kind of developed is from the fact that 
sometimes you train on a different distribution than your test distribution. Diffusion models are an emerging class of generative models that have recently grown in popularity due to their capability to generate diverse and high quality samples. Notably, an open source implementation, Stable Diffusion, has been widely adopted in reference. However, the model up to version 2.1 at the time of writing always generates images with medium brightness. The generated images have a mean brightness of around zero with a brightness scale from negative one to one. Okay, so I'm not sure what kind of brightness scale they're talking about, but there's probably some kind of specific definition for brightness when it comes to images and photography or something that's probably what they're referring to even with when paired with prompts that should elicit much brighter or darker results however the model fails to generate correct samples when paired with an explicit yet simple prompt such as solid black color or a white background so this might actually be how they discovered this we discovered so somebody probably typed solid black color into stable diffusion and then was like why is it unable to give me a solid black color right so this might actually be telling us exactly how they were able to intuit that there's something wrong with the schedule we discovered that the root cause of the issue resides in the noise schedule and the sampling implementation oh, highlighting incorrectly here today common noise schedules such as linear and cosine schedule so these are two different types of um, noise schedules so linear schedules generally start from some higher point and then uh, go down to a lower point right so in a linear learning rate schedule usually you start with a bigger learning rate and then it linearly goes down into a smaller learning rate uh, cosine schedules oscillate between two values right so a cosine looks like a basically like a wave and anytime you see cosine schedule, generally what's happening is it's starting high, then going low, then going back high, then going back low, then going back high, right? You have this kind of like up and down. So two different types of schedules. Those can also be applied to noise, but you can also do them in uh, learning rates, which is another place that schedules are used. Do not enforce the last time step to have zero signal to noise ratio. Yeah, so they're all about this last time step here. Right, this last step, the very last step when you go from the image that's basically already looks like noise into what should be pure noise, right? Or in their sense, it shouldn't be pure noise. Right, same thing here. That very last step is the most important there. At training, the last time step does not completely erase all the signal information. Right, whenever you're actually training, you're never actually getting to pure Gaussian noise, but then whenever you're performing inference, you are starting from pure Gaussian noise, so there's a mismatch there. The leaked signal contains some of the lowest frequency information, such as the mean of each channel, with the mode with, with which the model learns to read and respect for predicting the denoise output. So what do they mean by lowest frequency information? So sometimes in computer, in computer vision, people will say high frequency information and low frequency information, and the way to think about that is that low frequency information is high level things and high frequency information is low level things, which is kind of confusing because there's a flip there. So what is an example of high frequency information is like texture, right? So the exact uh, shading of uh, the, the hair here, right? the exact texture of that right so something that would you would the features that you would see at the very bottom of a convolutional neural net right convolution neural net I love my conv nets so let's, let's do one where you can actually see a little bit of the features mm, I can't find a good example but High frequency information will be closer to the image, and it's usually going to be things like texture. Low frequency information will be further away from the image, and it's going to be things like either semantic concepts, or here they're talking about the actual mean, right? The mean of each channel, and channel here refers to the red, green, and blue channel, right? There's three channels in images because of our three uh, cones in our eyes. So it says that the 
at training, the very last time step is not pure Gaussian noise because the mean of each channel is preserved, which means that it's noise, but the noise within the red, blue, and green channel has a specific mean. And the model is learning to be like, okay, this is the, the mean that you're starting from is here. So this image is a little bit more reddish than it is bluish or something like that, right? But then whenever you're taking that model and performing inference, you're giving a pure Gaussian noise. So you're telling it actually this image has the same exact R, G, and B means, which is something that it's not seen in training. However, this is incongruent with inference behavior. At inference, the model is given pure Gaussian noise at the last time step, which the mean is always centered around zero. This falsely restricts the model to generating final images with medium brightness. Hmm. So, okay, basically what the model has learned is that within the actual training distribution of images trained or images for stable diffusion, the model has learned that any image that ends or in this case starts with noise where all the channels have the same mean, it's learned that that only occurs in images that have medium brightness, right? So anytime you start inference with a pure Gaussian noise, what you're telling the model is this image is likely to have medium brightness. It's very unlikely that the final image that you generate from this is going to have a very dark areas and very light areas. So in a sense, you're constraining the model to a very specific part of the distribution that it's learned. Right, the model's very clever and it knows. Furthermore, newer samplers no longer require sampling of all the time steps. However, implementations such as DDIM and PNDM, so this is two slightly different ways of doing uh, diffusion. This is, fuck, I forget what these acronyms are. This is like pseudo numerical diffusion models, and this is denoising diffusion models let me actually see if i got those correct so reference number six and reference 16. so six is pseudo numerical methods for diffusion models on manifolds this is a slightly different way of doing diffusion models that kind of is popular i don't know it seems more complicated and then 16 what do we got here denoising diffusion implicit models okay so i didn't get the the eye there but this is the more uh classic way of doing diffusion where you're basically removing noise in this one, you're, I don't, know, I don't know if I can provide a good summary of what, what PNDMs are. Uh, do not start from the last time step in the sampling process, process, further exacerbating the issue. Okay, so they say that the current approaches for diffusion models don't even start from the last time step. So maybe you're, you're not even aware that this, this issue is, exists. We argue that noise schedules should always ensure zero SNR on the last time step, and samplers should always start from the last time step. Okay, so two different things here. One, the last time step should basically be pure uh, Gaussian noise, and then the samplers themselves should always go to that exact final time step. You don't want to be starting kind of in, uh, at intermediate time steps. We propose a simple way to rescale existing schedulers to ensure zero terminal SNR and propose a new classifier-free guidance rescaling technique to solve the image overexposure problem encountered as the terminal SNR approaches to zero. Okay. They're kind of saying the same thing over and over again, but I think they're kind of getting to exactly what they're going to be doing here. We train the model on the proposed schedule and sample it with the corrected implementation. Our experimentation shows that these simple changes completely resolve the issue. They did it. They fixed it. <laughs> these flawed designs are not exclusive to stable diffusion, but in general to all diffusion models. Yeah, and it's interesting because this isn't just uh, going to help uh, diffusion or image generation, right? I think diffusion models are starting to become popular in all kinds of different approaches, right? I've seen diffusion models for robotic control, there's diffusion model for reinforcement learning as well. There's all these different types of diffusion models. Now, diffusion as a high-level concept is almost becoming, uh, it's kind of having a similar path to uh, the transformer model, right? The transformer architecture started off within the field of basically language models, 
and then it expanded and now there's transformers everywhere and diffusion the the concept of diffusion is actually kind of having a similar kind of path i don't think it's it's not entirely known for sure whether diffusion is here to stay it could be the case that diffusion kind of disappears and no one remembers it about no one remembers diffusion anymore but people are starting to take the concept of diffusion and apply it to a bunch of different modalities a bunch of different problems within the general machine learning and ai field and it kind of works so uh, this little trick here that this uh, these guys figured out isn't just going to fix image generation. It's going to fix anybody that's using diffusion models. Uh, so they trained stable diffusion from scratch again. <laughs> Probably, or maybe, I don't know. I'm sure ByteDance can afford to do that, but I don't know if uh, they had the budget to do that. You know, like even if you, even if you're, paper comes from like a big company sometimes the individual research group within that big company doesn't have the budget to actually do that kind of training you know i think most research groups have like a limited training budget so it's not like any group in facebook has access to infinite gpus uh, diffusion models involve a forward and backward process the forward process destroys information by gradually adding gaussian noise to the data Right. Uh, commonly, according to a non-learned, manually defined variance schedule. Okay, so this is the noise schedule, right? And the variance of that noise is going to be uh, this beta, right? So here, this is a normal distribution. So this is Gaussian noise. This is a normal distribution, which is what a Gaussian is. And the first term here is the is the mean, right? So a Gaussian distribution centered on x of t, and then this is the variance, right? So, uh, the the second the the term at the end here is basically the variance, which is how wide the Gaussian distribution is, right? It's basically like is it really really flat and wide, and there's a lot of possible values, which is high variance. Or is the Gaussian distribution very narrow and very peaky, which means that it, all the values are going to be much more similar. So the variance of that noise is going to change over the course of the uh, diffusion process here, right? So uh, at time step capital T versus time step zero, you're going to have a different noise. Uh, what do we got here? The forward process allows sampling x of t at an arbitrary time step t in closed form. Ooh. This is kind of sloppy. They don't actually define uh, q and yeah, we don't really know what that is, q. We can guess, but I feel like you should define your equations, define your terms. Let alpha t equals one minus beta t and alpha bar t is the multiplication from s equals one to t of alpha s okay so alpha t is basically just your variance schedule but one minus that so it's kind of like going to be in the opposite direction and then alpha bar is just uh this giant pi symbol with the t and s equals one that basically just means you multiply all the alpha s's from s equals one to t so all they do is they take this noise here, this Gaussian noise, which they hear they're defining in terms of x of t and beta of t, and then they're just redefining it in terms of alpha bar of t. This is sloppy here too. Right here they use a bar, but here they use alpha bar. They probably meant to use the same symbol for both of these, but they got the LaTeX wrong. That's 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 sloppy paper writing right there. <laughs> they still haven't defined what Q is, and they they accidentally use the wrong uh, script letter here. I think this is supposed to be alpha bar. Uh, equivalently, x t is alpha bar t x naught plus the square root of one minus alpha bar t e, and e is the actual pure. Gaussian noise here so that this is pure uh, just a unit Gaussian sometimes it's called which is a Gaussian that has 
uh, identity as the variance and then it has uh, zero as the mean. And what they did here, this is often called the reparameterization trick, which is a, a way of basically reparameterizing a Gaussian distribution in a way that makes it easy to uh, pass gradients through. At least that's the way I kind of understand it. Signal to noise ratio, SNR, is a function of alpha bar, which is a function of beta, which is a function of the var which basically defines the variance. Okay. So the signal to noise ratio is basically directly dependent on the variance of the Gaussian, which you're uh, using to add the noise. That kind of makes sense, right? If your Gaussian has high variance versus low variance, it's going to change this signal to noise ratio. Diffusion models learn the backward process to restore information step by step. When beta t is small, the reverse step is also found to be Gaussian. Okay, so they still don't define this p as well. Generally, when you see a p theta like this, this means a neural net. So generally, this means a neural net parameterized by uh, some parameters theta. So the weights of the neural net are theta, and then p is some function, which is generally a neural net, but they literally still haven't defined what p is here. I guess p is the uh, reverse, the backward step, and then uh, q is the forward step. So maybe they're using the same here. So you see p is the forward step, and then q is the backward step, right? Give it, actually, here we go. So we're going to use the uh, math definitions that they have here in this blog post because I think this paper is using the same uh, equation. So. Uh, Q is the data distribution, the real data distribution. X naught is sampled from Q of X. And P, where is it? Beta T is small. We learn a model P theta to approximate these conditional probabilities in order to run the diffusion process. Yeah, so P theta is the model that learns to try to cre uh, guess the conditional probabilities and uh, allows you to run it in reverse. And then Q is the actual real data distribution. So Q at XT is basically XT minus 1 plus the noise, right? So Q at XT right here is just XT minus 1, and then you add noise to it. Okay, so P of theta, XT minus 1 given XT. So you see how uh, Q goes uh, in the opposite way. It goes from... Uh, xt minus 1 to xt. So you given xt minus 1, the function q will give you x of t. And then p, which is our neural network, right, is also a function. And p works the opposite way. p, you give it x of t, and it'll give you, or you condition it on x of t, and it'll give you x of t minus 1, right? So it's basically the, the backward step. Uh, you multiply all of those together, and that gives you p of theta for x from 0 to t. And this is just one step of it. Neural models are used to predict mu of t. So this is the mean of this normal distribution here. Commonly, the models are reparameterized to predict the noise instead. OK, so this term here, mu of t, you can rewrite it in terms of beta of t and alpha bar of t. And alpha bar of t is also a function of beta of t. So really, there's only basically two terms here. There's beta of t and x of t, because sigma here is just a unit Gaussian. And then alpha bar is basically a function of beta of t. But they rewrite it in this kind of tricky way so that they can basically pull it out like this. Variance beta of t can be calculated from the forward process posteriors. So 
not the best uh not the best summary of diffusion models i've heard of you know to be honest a little bit kind of confusing and sloppy but it's there uh, i think this blog post is probably way better this is a much much better explanation of this same uh set of equations look at that they even have nice little uh colored latex so you can understand exactly what's going on <laughs> we need 997 yeah they're like of course you should know this this is basic this is uh, uh seventh grade math and we don't need to summarize it for you <laughs> Enforce zero terminal SNR. Table one shows common schedule definitions and their SNR of T. So the signal to noise ratio, of course, is a function of T, which is the time step, right? Because SNR here is defined uh, as alpha bar T over one minus alpha bar T, and alpha bar is basically a uh, function of alpha t which is a function of beta t and then beta is entirely determined by the time step and it's just manually defined right someone just says this is what the beta of t at this specific time step is and uh, the square root of alpha bar t at the terminal time step t equals 1000 so there's a lot there's diffusion models that work with very few time steps right just a couple like even one time step i've seen even though it doesn't work super well but t equals 1000 is probably the most amount of time steps I've ever seen. So this is kind of the upper limit for the total amount of time steps. I think in practice, most diffusion models use something like 10 time steps. None of the schedules have zero terminal SNR. Moreover, cosine schedule deliberately clips beta to be no greater than 0 0.999 to prevent terminal SNR from reaching zero. Okay, so your schedules are basically going to be determining what the values of these betas are. And they're saying that none of them have the zero. We notice that the noise schedule used by stable diffusion is particularly flawed. Ooh. <laughs> stable diffusion is extra bad, is what they're telling you. The terminal SNR is far from reaching zero. Substituting the value into equation 4 also reveals that the signal is far from being completely destroyed at the final time step. Okay, so at the final time step, this is a uh, unit Gaussian, right? The pure Gaussian, if you want to think of it that way, right? Uh, sigma here, 0 and I. And they're saying that if you actually look at this, at the final time step, the image is actually like six you can roughly think of this as it's 99 percent pure gaussian noise and then six percent whatever the original image is x not here is the original image so what it's saying is that whenever you're actually training stable diffusion the image or the very last time step is basically about six percent the original image x not and then 99% pure Gaussian noise. But really, you would want it to be zero here. You would want this term to be zero. You would want there to be no dependence on the initial image at all. And then you want this term here to be basically one, right? And the reason you want to do that is because you want, uh, you want at inference, that's what's gonna happen. At inference, you're not gonna have, there's not gonna be an X naught, right? You're not gonna know what this X naught is. So you're gonna give it a basically pure noise. Uh, when t equals t at training, the input to the model is not completely pure noise. A small amount of signal is still included, right? The signal is the fact that a the very last time step, there's still a little bit of the original image in there. The leaked signal contains the lowest frequency information, such as the overall mean of each channel, right? And that's probably why it's people didn't notice it until now is because they looked at this and they're like, yeah, it kind of looks like noise to me. That looks fine, right? But that's not noise to the computer, right? The computer can tell, hey, actually, this picture is more blue than it is red, right? The, com the computer's aware of that. So kind of a, a interesting story there, right? In terms of like why we weren't able to see this until now. 
The model subsequently learns to denoise respecting the mean from the leaked signal. At inference, pure Gaussian noise is given for sampling instead. The Gaussian noise always has a zero mean. So the model continues to generate samples according to the mean given at t equals t, resulting in images with medium brightness. Is that a problem of t being too small for t? Uh, I think this would happen no matter what your capital T is. I think even if you had t equals 10 or t equals 1000 or t equals 3, you would have this same situation. So I think this applies to all, all diffusion models regardless of how many time steps they do. In contrast, the noise schedule with zero terminal SNR uses pure noise as input at t equals t during training, thus consistent with the inference behavior. The same problem extrapolates to all diffusion noise schedules in general, although other schedules terminal SNRs are closer to zero, so it is harder to notice in practice. We argue that diffusion noise schedules must enforce zero terminal SNR to completely remove the discrepancy between inference and training. This also means that we must use variance preserving formulation since variance exploding formulation cannot truly reach zero terminal SNR. Uh, variance preserving versus variance exploding. What do they mean by that? So the variance is controlled by this beta, which is basically you're defining this as the human. So variance preserving, I guess, maybe makes sure that the variance gets very, very close to this identity. And then variance exploding doesn't have that. I'm not entirely sure what they mean by here, but uh, let's keep going. We propose a simple fix by rescaling existing noise schedules under the variance preserving formulation to enforce zero terminal SNR. Okay, so it seems like basically they're bucketing any uh, noise schedule into two different buckets here. Either they're variance preserving, in which case they are going to enforce zero terminal SNR, or they're variance exploding, and there is no way that they would ever be able to reach uh, zero terminal SNR. Call an equation four that the square root of alpha bar t controls the amount of signal to be mixed in. The idea is to keep the square root of alpha bar one unchanged since, and then change alpha bar capital T to zero and linearly rescale alpha bar t for intermediate t two to t minus one. Okay, so really they, they don't care about the time steps in between, right? So they're like whatever noise schedule you were using, right? In between from time steps two to capital T minus one, who cares, right? Like whatever you were using, that's probably fine. What we really care about is the very first step and the very last step. So largely that seems like what they're gonna be focusing on. We find scaling the alpha bar T space can better preserve, preserve the curve than scaling in SNR T space. The PyTorch implementation is given in algorithm one. Okay, pretty cool. Let's, we're gonna, do they actually have code here? They do have code here. This is pretty good shit. Look at that. All right, we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Note that the proposed rescale method is only needed for fixing existing non-cosine schedules. Cosine schedules can simply remove the beta of T clipping to achieve zero terminal SNR. Okay, so clipping refers to uh, whenever you take a value and you clip it. So like a classic form of clipping would be in between zero and one. You clip it so that it's in between zero and one, right? So if you get a value of 1.001, .001, you clip it and it becomes one, right? And sometimes uh, clipping Gaussian distribution. So one thing that uh, clipping results in is in these Gaussian distributions that have like these little spikes at the end of them. Let me see if I can find an example of that. Mm, can't find a pick. Maybe this is kind of a pick. But Gaussian distributions, right, normal distributions are technically infinite. Like there is some tiny amount of probability mass 
at infinity, right? Like it, the tails go all the way to infinity. You technically, there's a non-zero probability of sampling from a Gaussian distribution and getting negative infinity, right? That, that probability is very small, but technically there's a non-zero probability. So sometimes when people clip these Gaussian distributions, they take all the probability mass that would basically normally go extend up until infinity and they kind of stack it. So there's actually a there's a there's a comparatively larger probability mass at the value of two than there is at the value right here. So if you ever see that, if you ever see a clipped Gaussian that goes like this and then it has this little bump up here, that means they're clipping it. But I don't think that's necessarily what they're referring to here. Uh, they remove the beta t clipping in a cosine schedule. So whenever you have a cosine schedule, and a cosine schedule is going to be a series of beta t's that you choose for a specific time, and they're somehow clipped. Schedules designed in the future should enter beta of t equals 1, right? So this is really what they want. Should ensure beta t equals 1. So beta t is the variance, right? And ultimately, you want this. You want to, at the very last time step, the noise should, or the the noise, right? It should be one times this uh, sigma here, which is pure Gaussian noise. And this capital I is just a bunch of ones on a diagonal, right? Uh, identity matrix. So this is what the the final uh, variance should look like. It should look like this, right? And what is this? This is basically just unit variance on every single dimension, right? And that's why beta at t equals 1. So that's where that 1 comes from, is they want it to be i. Uh, what do we got? OK, so now let's look at these figures and stuff here. Common schedule definitions and their SNR and alpha square root of alpha bar on the last time step. All schedules use a total time step t equals 1,000. None of the schedules has zero SNR on the last time step, causing inconsistency in train and inference behavior. So these are different types of schedules here. So you have linear, cosine, and then you have stable diffusion, which I guess uses a slightly different uh, schedule. Um, this is the signal to noise ratio at time step t, and this is the alpha bar at time step t, where t is the final time step. So it'd be great if they showed us what they want it to be, right? But basically, they're saying this should be 0, SNR of t should be 0, and this alpha bar, square root of alpha bar t should also be 0. So you can see how these values are very close to 0, but they're not 0. And here is the actual definition. So right, any, any schedule is just some equation that allows you to pick the value of beta according to a specific time step. So what a linear schedule is, is it basically says, okay, if you have a time step three and you have a total amount of time steps 1,000, then you're going to do three minus one over 1,000 minus one. That's going to give you i. You're going to do one minus i plus 0 0.002 or 0 0.02 times i times 0 0.0001, and that's going to give you your beta, and that's going to be the variance of the, of the noise that you add. So you can see how a linear uh, linear schedule is just linear in terms of the time step. Cosine is going to oscillate, right? Because you're you're basically the cosine function here oscillates back and forth. These numbers are basically just a bunch of weird hard coded crap hyperparameters that someone figured out. And then stable diffusion, what is this? It's a squared, so it's almost like a quadratic noise schedule. Do any of you know what, what the stable diffusion noise schedule is supposed to be? Is it basically just quadratic? Is there a fancier name for that? Uh, comparison between the original stable diffusion noise schedule and our rescaled noise schedule. OK, so this is the log of the signal to noise ratio. So why are they doing the log? The reason they're doing the log is because uh, these numbers are so small, it would be difficult to see, right? So if they just plotted this and it was just SNR of t, you wouldn't be able to tell, right? It would just look like they're zero. But 
they do the log of SNRT so that you can very clearly see right in this log plot uh, the fact that it, it is not the same, right? See this like kind of like it tails down as you get, uh, this is the time step, so capital T from 0 to 1000. So they're showing you here that the square root of alpha bar t, it does go exactly to 0, right? And then here, the orange, which is this paper, it goes down to basically negative infinity, which is uh, in the log scale means basically 0. Pretty cool, pretty cool little plots there. All right, let's look at algorithm one here. Rescaling schedule to zero terminal SNR. So you have a little function here. The function is called enforce zero terminal SNR. You're giving it betas, which is basically, I guess this, either a list of those things or a function, a callable type of those. Alphas equals one minus betas. Alpha bar equals alphas dot uh, cumulative product, so this is uh, this here, right? You see, this is uh, multiplying a bunch of these alpha bar S's, or alpha S's, and that's exactly what this is. Cumulative product. That gives you alpha bar, and then you square root that to get the square root of alpha bar T, which is this right here. Store the old values. Alpha bar square root at time step zero is the very first one, right? You're going to have a the length of this list betas is going to be the number of total time steps t. So time step zero is going to correspond to the the first element. At time step capital T, it's going to correspond to the last element. Whenever you see a negative one like this in Python, it basically just means the last element of this list. Uh, here, so they're like copying it basically here. That's what that dot clone means. Shift, so the last time step is zero. So alpha bar square root minus equals alpha bar square root of t. Okay, so they're taking every single uh, value, every single element in this list and subtracting the last time step. So it's, it's like they're taking every single b of t and subtracting this uh, value here, so 2.42, whatever, whatever, to the negative 0, 0.9, or the alpha bar equivalent of that. So actually, they're subtracting this here. And that means that the very last one will be 0, and all the ones before that will be slightly smaller. Scale, so the first time step is back to the old value. Okay, so this is kind of like a normalization, right, where you're saying here is the highest value it's, it's going to be, right, at time step 0, it's going to be this. Here is the lowest value it's going to be at time step t, which is here. So you have the value here and the value here. You're saying that is basically what I'm normalizing to, and I'm basically going to multiply every single element in this list by that. So they're they're recentering it, making sure the last one is zero, and then uh, normalizing it. Convert alpha bar square roots to betas. Alpha bar equals alpha bar square root squared. So they get rid of that square root by squaring it here. That's what those two little asterisks means. Alpha bar 1, 2. So this is called slicing. And what you're doing is you're basically saying, give me all the elements in this list, but not the first element, right? So starting at element 1 all the way to the end. And this is slicing, but the opposite way. So you're saying, give me all of the elements in this list, alpha's bar, but up until the last element, so everything but the last element, basically. They're dividing it. So basically, this is kind of the ratio of one to the next one, because you're basically, this, they're offset by one at this point. Uh, Torch.cat, this is a uh, concatenating, right? So you're basically saying uh, all of this, which is uh, specific, the very first element here, and then adding this thing here, or not adding, you're basically just concatenating. So taking two vectors or two tensors or two matrices and then just basically doing that. There's also vertical concatenation, horizontal concatenation. There's, you can concatenate on any kind of axis. 
and then betas is just 1 minus that. So I feel like this could probably be made faster to be honest, but I don't know, I guess if you're using a modern deep learning framework like PyTorch, it doesn't matter if you necessarily write your code in the most optimal way because the compiler is and the graph kind of optimization step that most of the modern frameworks run will do that for you, right? So whenever you write uh, code like this in a machine learning framework, generally what happens nowadays, and Jax is famous for doing this, but PyTorch also does this now as well, is the first time that it runs, it creates this kind of graph, and then the machine learning framework will look at that graph that you created and be like, okay, actually there's a faster way to run this and a faster way to kind of like create a computational graph that does the same thing, but works faster on hardware. And it'll basically compile it into that new computational graph. So it used to be the case that you had to kind of be clever about how you did these things and, and kind of understood that, okay, do I want to take the square root and then do these things and then square it and then do this normalization and then do this concatenation? You have to be like careful about how you do that, but increasingly more and more, it doesn't actually matter because the machine learning frameworks are capable of taking your shitty code and making it slightly less shitty because uh, they're kind of clever and they're doing this kind of like compilation type uh, process. Hopefully we'll be seeing Mojo code in the papers next year. Yeah, we'll see if Mojo becomes popular at all, you know? I don't know, I, I'm kind of like even more futuristic. I think that Mojo is actually not going to become popular because somebody's gonna make uh, a version of Python that's even, that's not, it's not, it won't be called Python, but it'll just be natural language. Like someone's gonna figure out how to compile natural language into LLVM, you know, into like machine code. And then all these intermediate languages like Python, C, like we won't need any of those anymore, right? You'll just describe in English what you want and then a computer will compile that down into machine code or some kind of like LLM kind of computer hybrid. So I don't know. I feel like the days of programming are coming to an end and Mojo is maybe already outdated. Trained with V-prediction and V-loss. So this is the velocity prediction and velocity loss that they described in the uh, abstract. When signal-to-noise ratio is zero, uh, sigma prediction becomes a trivial task and sigma loss cannot guide the model to learn anything meaningful about the data. We switch to V-prediction and V-loss as proposed in 13. Okay, so this is the original paper that proposes that. Progressive distillation for fast sampling of diffusion models. Sometimes I read these paper titles and I'm like, did I read this? And I'm just like, too stupid. And I just like forgot about it already. <laughs> uh, I feel like learning is like leaky bucket. You know, the more I learn, the less I know. We switch to V prediction. Okay, so V of T. So V is defined at every time step, right? There's going to be T different Vs. It's equal to alpha bar T times the pure noise plus one minus, or minus one, square root of one minus alpha bar t times x naught. So the original image, this is pure noise, and then these alpha bars are a, basically a function of your schedule, okay? And L, this fancy script L is a loss, and the tilde here probably represents the true, so the ground truth V of t, and then this represents the predicted V of T or like the V of T that results from using your model. And then here you have an L2 loss. So the L2 difference between those and then multiplied by uh, whatever Lambda T is, which is probably some kind of uh, schedule on the loss itself as well. We fine tune using, okay, so it's actually it's, it's nothing. <laughs> it's literally Lambda T is equal to one. So at any time step t, it's just equal to one. All right. After rescaling the schedule to have zero terminal SNR, t equals capital T alpha bar, capital T equals zero, so v capital T equals x naught. 
Therefore, the model is given pure noise as input to predict X0 as output. At this particular time step, the model is not performing the denoising task since the input does not contain any signal. Rather, it is repurposed to predict the mean of the data distribution conditioned on the prompt and influenced by the input noise. Hmm. Yeah, so this is almost the most important sentence in this entire paper here, rather, right? Where it's saying that what ends up happening at this very first time step is that the model just picks what the means of each of the channels are, right? So, right, they were talking about how whenever you type in solid black background into diffusion or into stable diffusion it's like incapable of doing that right because you're already telling it give me a solid black background where the red blue and green channels all have the same uh, mean and they're centered around zero right and stable diffusion is like I'm confused because uh, in the distribution that I was trained on any picture that has the solid black background doesn't have this mean always centered around zero for each of the channels so you probably want a picture that kind of is a solid black background but has this kind of medium brightness situation. So what they realized here is that whenever you force the SNR to be zero at the end, right, what you're largely doing is you're making sure that at that very first time step, you're letting the model pick the mean of the data distribution, obviously conditioned on the prompt, where the prompt here is going to be the text such as uh, black background. We fine-tune stable diffusion model using a VLOS with lambda t equals 1 and find the visual quality similar to using the Cigna loss. We recommend always using V prediction for the model and adjusting lambda t to achieve different loss weighting if desired. This would have been great if you did a little ablation study, but I don't know if they did a little ablation study. Newer samplers are able to sample much fewer steps to generate visually appealing samples. Yeah, so everyone loves to kind of shit on diffusion models because they take all these time steps. So there's a huge amount of research and papers about how to reduce the amount of time steps and samples, right? Fewer steps. I've even seen uh, this one, Paya. Diffusion. Yeah, I think this one is like one time step or something even crazier like that. But reducing the number of inference steps. A novel text to image model that requires less than 10 steps. So there's a lot of work that's being done to, to reduce the total amount of steps and improve the inference speed. Uh. So in this paper, they're always using t equals 1,000 and only perform a few sample steps, s equals 25, at inference. So you can change the number of steps that you train on versus the steps that you perform at inference. But I feel like if you trained on t equals 1,000 steps and you are using t equals 25 at inference, it's like, that just doesn't seem right to me. I feel like that there's going to be there's going to be issues, right? There's going to be issues when you're using different hyperparameters at training than you're using at inference, just fundamentally. So I don't think that's a good idea. However, many implementations, including the official DDIM and PNDM implementations, do not properly include the last time step in the sampling process, as shown in Table Two. So. What they're saying is that people train with a lot of time steps, then they end up reducing the number of time steps at inference. And not only is that necessarily not good, but they actually they also do not include the last time step. So it's even worse than that. This is also incorrect because models operating at t less than t are trained on non-zero SNR inputs and thus inconsistent with the inference behavior. For the same reason, this contributes to the brightness problem. We argue that sampling from the last time step in conjunction with a noise schedule that enforces zero terminal SNR is crucial. Only this way, when pure Gaussian noise is given to the model at the initial time step, the model is actually trained to expect such input at inference. Yeah, so 
I mean, this paper, like, they keep saying the same thing 50 times in a row. Like, honestly, it sounds like they just have one point to make, and they just, like, say it 700 times in different ways, but... I don't know. I guess they, they want credit for their little bug that they found. We consider two additional ways to select sample steps. Lin space, so uh, some kind of linear. Uh, lin space is like a NumPy function, actually. NumPy. Yeah, it's a blast from the past if you, if you guys have used uh, NumPy's lin space, but you basically give it a start and a stop, and it'll give you a uh, a bunch of numbers in between it with a specific uh, spacing. So here, NP lin space two ten five means give me five numbers in between two and, z and ten. Uh, so two additional ways to select sample steps. So you can select sample steps. Let's say you're training with a thousand steps and you only want to do 25 steps at inference, then one way to do that is just lin space. Okay, so in which includes the first and the last time steps and then evenly selects intermediate time steps. A different technique is called trailing. So trailing is when you include the last time step and then a bunch of intermediate time steps with an even interval starting from the end. Right, so the problem with trailing is that you you're picking the last one, but you're not picking the first one. So you're picking the last one, a bunch of intermediate ones, but no guarantee of necessarily picking the first time step. Note that the selection of the sample step is not bound, that's incorrect there, to any particular sampler and can be easily interchanged. Comparison between sample step selections, T is the total discrete time steps the model is trained on, S is the number of sample time steps used by the sampler. We argue that the sample steps should always include the last time step. Examples here for T equals 1000, S equals 10. Note that the time step here uses 1 to 1000 to match the math notation used in the paper, but in most implementations we use the time step 0 to 999. Yeah, so unfortunately most math is indexed in one, so uh, this is sometimes called one indexing, but pretty much all programming is zero index. So the first element in a uh, Python list is the zeroth element, but the first element in math is the first element. So it's a little bit unfortunate that uh, math is one indexed and programming is generally zero indexed. and not only is that the case, but you actually have some programming that is one index. So uh, MATLAB, which is a, I don't, I don't even know if people use MATLAB anymore, but maybe, maybe you guys use it. I only really use this in college, but MATLAB is one indexed, which is weird. Um, okay, so we got leading, lin space, and trailing. So these are different, uh, select, different ways of selecting sample steps. So how do you pick? the specific points along the uh, total amount of time steps. So here's your lin space, 1 to t, and s total. You have an a range from 1 to t plus 1, and you're going in intervals of floor t, t over s. So uh, t over s is uh, you're dividing, right? And whenever you divide, you're going to have a remainder. And what this floor function here does is it basically gets rid of that remainder. So uh, 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. The floor of that would be 2. So that's why they're doing that, because they want uh, an integer here. Uh, flip a range from t to 0 in steps of negative t to S, and then you flip it like that, and then you round. So round here is just a rounding, like you would round a decimal into an integer. So they plug in some values here. If you have S equals 10 and T equals 1000, this is the actual time steps that you would end up sampling. So with leading, you would sample the first time step, but you, you see you would never sample the 1000th time step. Lin space, you sample the first time step, and you also sample the 1,000th, one the very last time step. And trailing, you sample the very last time step, but you don't sample the very first time step. So I think this is really the one that they 
they're going to try to convince us is the best because you sample both the first time step and the very last time step. We find that trailing has a more efficient use of the sample steps. Okay, so maybe not. Maybe they don't care. Maybe the only thing that they care about is that the very last time step is there. They don't care about the first one. This is because for most schedules, X1 only differs to X0 by a tiny amount of noise controlled by beta 1, and the model does not perform many meaningful changes when sampled at t equals 1. Okay, so maybe they don't care about the very first time step because by that point, the image is basically largely rendered, especially like this is uh, four steps, so it feels like going from this to this makes a big difference, but if you have 1,000 steps, right, going from the very second to first step to the first step doesn't actually matter that much is that that's what they're trying to tell you here we switch to trailing for future experimentation and use ddim to match our official the official stable diffusion implementation rescaling classifier free guidance we find that as the terminal snr approaches zero classifier free guidance becomes very sensitive Ugh, cold coffee. And can cause images to be overexposed. So this is the another way of saying the brightness is too too much brightness. This problem has seen has been noticed in other works. For example, image gen uses cosine schedule, which has a near zero terminal SNR, and proposes dynamic thresholding to solve the overexposure problem. Okay, so image gen I think is actually Google's work. Ooh. Yeah, image gen is Google's diffusion model. But do these look like they have dark darks? They do not. I mean, look at that. None of the blacks here are, are super dark. Maybe the black here and the black in the glass is a little bit dark. But definitely, you're not definitely getting that kind of cinematic look. Uh, but image gen seems to have some kind of trick here, dynamic thresholding that solves that, or attempts to solve that. Uh, inspired by it, we propose a new way to both rescale classifier-free guidance that is applicable to both image and latent space models. Uh, okay, so this is an additional problem, right? Is that what do they mean here by image space and latent space models is that most uh, diffusion, a lot of diffusion models, I don't, know, I don't know if I want to say most, but a lot of diffusion models, they're not uh, operating in pure image space. So image space would be this, right? The actual picture, right? The actual pixels in the real image. But a lot of diffusion models, they're operating in what's called latent space, which is this thing here, this little rainbow colored little latent tensor, right? Little latent vector. And what that means is that they take every single image that they're going to train on, they run it through some kind of encoder, right? Usually a ConvNet at this point, probably a vision transformer. They turn it into this little small little like thumbnail looking latent. And then that's where they actually do the, uh, the denoising with the time steps. And then they take the final little latent that you get and then they run it through the correspondingly de corresponding decoder here where the encoder decoder here are a VQ GAN and uh, convert it back into image space. So what they're trying to say here is that in image gen they have this problem where you have this uh, brightness problem but the way that they solve it in ImageNet is using dynamic thresholding but dynamic thresholding only works in image space. That's kind of like a just a photography trick basically. You can't do that in latent space, right? So they're saying, here's how you would uh, rescale classifier-free guidance in such a way that you can do it in either in an image space model or in a latent space model. Equation 13 shows regular classifier-free guidance, where W is the guidance weight. So this is going to be... Expose and ex neg are the model outputs using positive and negative prompts. Right, so classifier free guidance, you run inference basically twice. You run inference once with this, with no guidance, and you get x positive. You run uh, inference again 
with guidance, and that gives you the x negative, you take the difference between those and you multiply them by your weight, and that'll basically allow you to control. So you're like, I want to remove noise from this image conditioned on the fact that this uh, noise that removes should make my image look more like a cat, right? Something like that. And then you're going to say, okay, I'm going to remove noise from the image without saying that, and then I'm going to remove noise from the image saying you should do this in the, in the way that with this prompt that says, I don't know, like cat or something like that, right? And the difference between those, now you have this little W. Now you have this W that you can, this little slider that you can control that allows you to, to basically control how much the prompt is affecting your actual image that is coming out. We find that when W is large, the scale of the resulting X CFG is very big, causing the image overexposure problem. To solve it, we propose to rescale after applying classifier-free guidance. Okay, so basically they're just going to normalize this is what I'm getting at. Sigma pose is the standard deviation of X pose. Sigma CFG is the standard deviation of X CFG. X rescaled is equal to X CFG times the ratio of those standard deviations. And x final is phi times x rescaled plus 1 minus phi times x CFG. Where what is phi? Uh, it's an extra hyperparameter which controls the rescale strength. <laughs> I don't know about that. Now you have all this extra crap, right? Now you have a guidance weight parameter, hyperparameter that you have to pick, and there's also this now this extra phi that you have to pick. So. It's a lot of extra crap there that you have to decide on. A lot of hyperparameters. We compute the standard deviation of X pose X CFG as sigma pose sigma F, uh, F CFG, uh, which are real numbers. That's what that means. This little script R or fancy R. We rescale X CFG back to the original standard deviation before applying classifier free guidance, but discovered that the generated images are overly plain. What does that mean? <laughs> Evaluation. We fine-tune stable diffusion base model on Leon dataset after changing the noise schedules. This is the actual dataset to enforce zero terminal SNR. Okay, so one of you was actually asking whether they're retraining stable diffusion from scratch. The answer is no, they are not retraining stable diffusion from scratch. They're taking the stable diffusion base model and they're fine-tuning it, so they're just pushing more gradients into it. Which is kind of interesting because that means that the question is still out there, what would happen if you retrained all of Stable Diffusion with this new stuff? After changing the noise schedule to enforce zero terminal SNR and switching to the V prediction objective, our Leon dataset is filtered similar, similarly to the data used by the original Stable Diffusion. We use the same training configuration. Batch size of 2048, which is a fucking huge batch size. That means you're using a large GPU cluster. A learning rate of 1e to the negative 4. Exponential moving average weight decay of 0.99. And they train for 50k iterations. So 50k iterations doesn't sound like a lot, but when you see the batch size of 2048, it just means that you're using a lot of GPUs in parallel. We also train an, uh, train an unchanged reference model from on our filtered lay on data for fair comparison. Okay, so they're gonna fine tune stable diffusion with their uh, zero terminal SNR and their tricks that they defined. And then they're also going to fine tune a stable diffusion model on in the original vanilla way, but also on their filtered lay on data set so you can compare. I like this, this is a very good idea. The unchanged reference model also fine tuned in the same way, That's that's clever. Uh, figure 3 shows our method can generate images with diverse brightness range. Specifically, the model with the flawed design always generates samples with medium brightness. It is unable to generate correct images when Sol given explicit prompts such as white background and solid black background. In contrast, our model is able to generate according to the prompts perfectly. You know what I'm actually curious about? Let's uh, do this. 
So I have mid journey here. And let me do this dash imagine a black circle on a solid white background. Let's see if mid journey uh, suffers from this issue. Uh, we follow the convention to calculate the Frechet inception distance, my uh, least favorite <laughs> uh, quantitative quality score. All right, so here's what we got. That doesn't look like a solid white background to me, and that doesn't look like a solid black sphere to me. That's pretty good, though. Let's see. A solid uh, white sphere on a solid white or solid black background. We randomly select 10K images from Coco 2014. Why are people still using Coco? Like, come on, dude. This is an ancient data set at this point. And use our models to generate with the corresponding captions. Show that our model has improved FID and inception score. Suggesting our model better fits the image distribution. Are more visually appealing. I feel like these two are not necessarily in the same direction. I feel like visually appealing and better fitting the image distribution aren't necessarily going to be in tandem, right? I feel like there's something, the cine, the cine, cinematographic look, cinematic look isn't actually realistic, you know? Uh, SD with base, so FID is a distance metric, so lower is better. Inception score is a score higher is better. You can see that the official versus theirs slightly improved. So, I don't know, it seems like there's improvement there. Let's look at our stable diffusion. I mean, that's pretty good. Hmm. Uh, quantitative evaluation, all models use DDIM sampler. Okay, let's copy these, see what stable diffusion or mid journey gives us. Dash prompt. Oh. Uh, all models use the DDIM sampler with S equals 50 steps, guidance weight. 7.5, no negative prompt, R uses zero terminal SNR, noise schedule, V prediction, trailing steps, and guidance rescale factor. Yeah, so this is the problem is that like because they introduced all this extra all these extra hyperparameters, now you have to set values for these, which is kind of annoying. Let's see. Let's see what we're getting with mid journey. Yeah, much darker darks here. I think it's noticeable here in the sky, right? The, the kind of diffuse look that they're talking about. Qualitative comparison. After applying all the proposed fixes, different negative prompts are used. So, I mean, you guys tell me, does this look like it has the same mistake? Yeah, I feel like this is the same as the original Stable Diffusion, right? Where it's like it doesn't really want to have a pure black background, but it does feel a little bit more cinematic. I think it's just because the quality is better. It's just more realistic, but it's hard to say. I don't know. I'm not much of a stable diffusion user, to be honest. I very much use uh, Mid Journey as my image AI, so I'm not super well versed on how to prompt engineer stable diffusion. Ablation. Okay, so here they're going to try different values for their hyperparameters, and let's see what they end up deciding. 
Compare sampling using leading lens space and trailing on our model train with zero terminal SNR noise. When sample step S is small, e.g. taking S equals 5 as an extreme example, so only 5 steps in inference, trailing noticeably outperforms lens space. But for common choices such as S equal 25, the difference between trailing and lens space is not easily noticeable. When using leading, the image composition is more susceptible to the change of S and the brightness range is not as diverse as lens space and trailing. Uh, Close-up photograph sampled with DDIM, same seed. Uh, this just means that the noise that they're starting from is the same, right? The seed defines the random uh, noise. When the sample step is extremely small, noticeably better than lens space. When the sample step is large, the difference between the trailing and lens space is subtle. Okay. So here they're saying that the difference here is bigger than the difference here. Visualizes sample steps on our model trained uh, with zero terminal SNR schedule at t equals t. The model generates the mean data distribution based on the prompt with very subtle variations based on the input noise. Visualization of the sample steps on prompt an astronaut riding a horse horizontal axis at time step t. So here you have starting at the very last time step, which should be pure noise, and then going to the very first time, or not the first, but at least the hundredth time step. At t equals t, the model generates the mean of the data distribution based on the prompt with extremely subtle variations based on the input noise. So there's this kind of object-centric kind of uh, mean you see here where basically there's a one thing in the middle and then the sky around it and then the floor around it. But then as soon as you go further, you see how it, it changes. So almost all of the the image, the composition of the image is entirely decided here at the very beginning from time step 1000 to time step 900. Right, it's like by, by the time you get here to, to step 700, it's like the image is already decided. And then everything after that is basically just filling in little details. It's kind of interesting to think about. Effect of classifier-free guidance rescale compares the result of you do using different rescale factors. So this is the hyperparameter that they defined. So I'm glad that they uh, show you what different values of those will result in. Uh, corresponding to rescale factor phi equals zero. So this is what uh, without this extra trick, the images tend to overexpose. I would agree with that. The overexposure on this owl is particularly bad. We empirically find that setting phi to be within 0.5 and 0.75 produces the most appealing results. So they're saying in between these two is what you want. There's like some weird effect going on here with this phi equals one. I would almost say this owl is the best, but that's just a style choice. Comparison of classifier free guidance rescale factor by. All images use DDIM sampler with 25 steps and guidance weight of 0.7.5. Classifier-free guidance is equivalent and can cause overexposure. We find that 0.5 to 0.75 to work well. The positive prompts are a zebra, a watercolor, and blah, blah. Different negative prompts are used. So classifier-free guidance, the way that I've been explaining it, is like you condition with the thing and then you condition without the thing but it seems like in all of these examples they talk about negative prompts and I think that's what the way that they use it here right so rather than saying uh, generated with the guidance and the, or generated with conditioned on the thing and then generated conditioned on nothing they're actually generated on the thing and then generated conditioned without the or on a negative thing so That's more, I guess, indicative of the way that people actually use classifier-free uh, guidance. But the way I describe it is the way that 
I, I read it in a paper, not the way that people actually use it, but it seems like the way that people use it is for negative prompts. Comparison to offset noise. Offset noise is another technique proposed in one to address the brightness problem. Instead of sampling that, just pure noise, they propose to sample EHWC. Oh shit, look at that. So. Uh, this is noise that is just uh, normal Gaussian noise, but then here HWC, HWC is height width channel, which are the basically the height of the image, the width of the image, and then the channels in the image, so the red, green, and blue. And they're saying that you want to sample from a distrib normal a Gaussian distribution where the mean of the distribution is dependent on the channel. You see the mean here is pure Gaussian, but the same mean is used for every pixel in every channel. This is kind of weird. I don't know exactly what You're sampling twice is basically what they're saying. You first sample the value for this, and then you sample the value for that. When using offset noise, the noise at each pixel is no longer independently distributed. Since uh, delta C, I'm pretty sure that's delta, delta lowercase, yeah, lowercase delta, since delta C shifts the entire channel together. The mean of the noised input is no longer indicative of the mean of the true image. Therefore, the model learns to not respect the mean of its input when predicting the output at all time steps. So even if pure Gaussian noise is given at t equals t, and the signal is leaked by the flawed noise schedule, the model ignores it and is free to alter the output mean at every time step. Hmm. Okay, so they, they do this so that you don't have the same mean at every single pixel in within the channel you have a different uh, mean or you have the same mean at every pixel in every channel what I need more coffee and I need water offset noise does enable stable diffusion to generate very bright and dark samples, but it is incongruent with the theory of diffusion process and may generate samples with brightness that do not fit the true data distribution, i.e. too bright or too dark. It is a trick that does not address the fundamental issue. Okay, so they don't want the noise to be centered on zero. They're saying the, the noise here is offset and what they mean by offset is that the center of the Gaussian is shifted right it's shifted by this amount here which is also based on some Gaussian distribution and they're calling this offset noise but they say that it's not a good trick so <laughs> who cares don't use it is basically what they're saying in summary, we have discovered that diffusion models should use noise schedules with zero terminal SNR and should be sampled starting from the last time step in order to ensure that training behavior is aligned with inference. We have proposed a simple way to rescale existing noise schedules to enforce zero terminal SNR and a classifier-free guidance rescaling technique to counter over-image exposure. Yeah. Cool. Is there anything else? Nope, that's pretty much it very short paper just seven pages and it was actually quite repetitive let me let me kind of do a final summary here so okay we finished the paper what do i think about this so i think that to me largely this is a good paper but it's not a good paper and let me explain so i think it's a good paper in that what they found is very important this uh noise schedule large this is basically a bug right this is a bug that they found in the implementation of diffusion models where because they're not enforcing the pure noise at the end, you end up getting this kind of brightness problem. And 
they're showing you this bug specifically in the image generation space, but anybody who uses diffusion models in any other kind of uh, problem is going to have the same problem, right? Whether you're using diffusion models for audio, diffusion models for diffusion models for robotic control, whatever you're doing, you're going to run into this issue. So I think it's a it's a very good that they found this bug and that they explain it to you and that they show you kind of where it comes from and here are some techniques to fix it. So why do I think this is a bad paper? Because I just don't feel like this is a paper. You know, like to to me this is like a this is like a pull request. You know, it's like you basically just have one pull request that solves this in the particular uh repo and that's it, you know? So I feel like like you don't really need an entire paper to explain this. I feel like you you can explain this in a paragraph and it's totally fine. And that's kind of what I felt like when I read this paper. It felt like they were just telling me the same thing over and over again in in the same they were basically just writing the same paragraph 5 times in a row. And even if even doing that, they barely filled 7 pages. So yeah. I think they found an important bug and they wanted credit for it, hence they made the paper, but I don't know if it's necessarily worth an entire paper. But I do think that the bug that they found is very important and I'm glad that they were able to find it. Uh, so yeah, that's 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 what I think about this. Do I think diffusion models are flawed? Uh, no, but they are flawed in this particular bug, so as long as you fix this bug, you're good to go. Uh, cool. What are we at? What are we at here in terms of time? What time is it? I think we still have some time. So, you know what? Before I close all of this, why don't we, uh, do you guys want to figure out what the next paper we read tomorrow is? Let's do that. Let's go into our thing here. Uh, there was a bunch of papers recommended. Let's see. We got this one. We got this one. We got this one what else we got this one we got this one uh, we got which one were the popular ones here we got Dr. Llama we got this one and then there was a couple other ones that I saw on the internet the two Facebook ones Okay, so these are all different papers that we could read tomorrow. <laughs> we got reinventing RNNs for the Transformer era. This is, what the fuck is this, dude? Why is there like 700 colleges here? Eleuther AI is a open source uh, organization for AI so maybe what's happening here is that these people are all from Eleuther AI but they're also part of a bunch of other universities so this is kind of what an open source kind of paper looks like uh, RNNs are recurrent neural networks which is basically a common sequence uh, model that people used to use a lot but I feel like they kind of died out in terms of the transformer or died out uh, in the preference of transformers Okay, so we have basically like a model architecture paper. Uh, weekly papers, let's do this. Drag your GAN, Lima, less is more for alignment. Let's move that over here. This is a paper that I've seen. This is basically a meta AI CMU representing. What is this? Large language model. 65B language model fine-tuned with the standard supervised lost on curated prompts without any reinforcement learning. Okay, so basically fine-tuning a language model. Okay. Hyena hierarchy towards larger convolution language model. Okay, so some language model that uses convolutions. What is this coming out of? This is Stanford University and Mila. 
Mila is the uh, uh, research group that, uh, what the fuck is his name? One of, one of the famous machine learning research guys is from Mila. I forget what his name is. Uh, the one that left Google. Uh, what do we got here? Discovering latent knowledge. Okay, so we got another language model paper. You guys, you guys only recommend language model papers. <laughs> Look at this. All of these are language model papers. Why, why do you guys only care about language models? <laughs> You guys got to give me computer vision papers. Like, I'm going to die over here. I'm just, like, constantly reading these language papers. <laughs> uh, language models without supervision, latent knowledge. Okay, so another little UC Berkeley language paper. Uh, what do we got here? Another language paper, improving language models on PubMed QA, MIT, CSAIL. Okay. Nerf Bridge, this this one, I think I recommended this one, which is why I uh, picked it, but this is kind of cool. It's basically Nerf applied to Ross. As soon as I see this, I see robot operating system here, Ross, and I see Nerf Studio. I was like, shit, this could be kind of cool, but actually, this paper is fucking tiny. What is this? This is like three pages. Okay, well, I don't know about that. Uh, let's see if this paper... Let's go to uh, Hugging Face, AK Papers. This guy, AK, has daily papers. What do we got? Augmenting agents, code composing, fine tuning, user centric data. Oh, let's see if there's anything yesterday. Retrieval data set. Entity seeking queries. How does retrieval scale to millions of passages? Pengi, this guy has an emoji. Look at that. Audio language model for audio tasks. Scaling laws for language encoding models in fMRI. Ooh, this is from University of Texas at Austin. Fuck me up. Let's see. I'm biased towards Carnegie Mellon papers and University of Texas Austin papers. Performance of an encoding model. Wasn't there like a big Facebook paper with uh, speech? This is the one that we read. Open shape, scaling up 3D shape representation towards open world understanding. This looks kind of cool. Doesn't have a lot of comments though. Palm 2 technical report. Now we're starting to get into like old stuff here. This is the one that I saw. Cost former. Let's see. Papers with code. Let's look at this. Tree of thought. This is one that I've seen. Uh, this one's a little bit older. Easy spider speech GPT. Fast Composer, Vision LLM. Large Language Model is also an open-ended decoder for vision-centric tasks. That sounds kind of cool. Let's see. PDF. PDF. Visual prompt tuning, vision LLMs, flexibly manage vision-centric tasks using language instructions. 
So it's kind of cool. What about this? Tree of Thought. This is one that I see on Twitter. Google DeepMind and Princeton University. Various approaches to problem solving. Each rectangle represents a thought, which is a coherent language sentence that serves as an intermediate, so it's like chain of thought kind of situation, except rather than having a chain of thought, you have a tree of thoughts. And then they probably just do some fancy RL on top of that. Everyone is obsessed with language models. Ooh, we supported image bind. This seems to be like part of a whole set of work here, right? It seems to be like there's other papers beforehand, intern GPT plus image bind, intern GPT, and then this seems to be like the third one on top of that. Hmm. I'm kind of leaning towards this one just because it's Carnegie Mellon. But this paper just looks so boring. <laughs> Look at all this text. Like, who has time for all this text? Like... To me, what, what makes a paper interesting is whenever they're actually proposing something that's kind of unique and kind of makes you think about, makes you build intuition about like deep learning and learning in general. I generally don't like to read papers where all they do is they just like combine four different things and they just make it work. Like the difference between like kind of an engineering paper and a science paper, right? Like some papers are more kind of engineering papers where they're just like, hey, here's this one little tiny trick that works for this one little tiny data set and here's what we did, right? But then there's other papers that try to kind of answer more fundamental questions and build more fundamental intuition. And I feel like those are the ones that you really wanna be reading. Recurrent neural networks exhibit scaling in memory and computation, but struggle to match the performance. We propose a novel model architecture, receptance weighted key values. Our approach leverages a linear attention mechanism and allows us to formulate the model as either transformer or an RNN. Yeah, but like realistically here, they're like, our experiments reveal that RWKV performs on par with a similarly sized transformer. So, okay, you just found some weird transformer that basically works works like a transformer, but is weird. I feel like this could be kind of cool because it, if you read this kind of paper, I feel like we're going to come out of this understanding transformers better, you know. So I'm kind of I'm kind of leaning towards that paper. Let's see this paper. Large language models are trained in two stages: unsupervised pre-training from raw text. Well, we measure the relative importance of these two stages by training Lima. Lima demonstrates remarkably strong learning how to follow specific response formats from only a handful of examples, including complex queries. See, I kind of like this too, because here this seems like very sciencey, right? Where they're basically going to try to figure out 
how, how like this is kind of like a fine tuning paper right like what exactly are you doing when you're fine tuning and like this seems interesting too right These results strongly suggest that almost all knowledge in large language models is learned during pre-training and only limited instruction tuning data is necessary to teach models to produce high quality output. Yeah, this this is big, right? Because I, I kind of have this intuition and I feel like mo most people have this intuition that the overwhelming majority of the intelligence of a language model is the pre-trained model, right? People have this idea of like, oh, I'm going to make Dr. GPT and Lawyer GPT and we're going to like fine tune GPT on all these different data sets. And then, and I'm like, that's not what's going to happen. And like if you fine tune a large language model on medical data, it'll be better than the original language model on that medical data. But then as soon as someone makes a bigger language model, that bigger language model will probably be better than your fine tuned doctor model. So I think these kind of, papers probably let you know that like the the future is one big giant model that does everything not this idea that some people have that you're going to have a bunch of different fine-tuned models because I, I think the fine-tuning actually makes them stupider so i like this i like these two papers We propose hyena, a subquadratic drop and replacement for attention constructed by interleaving implicitly parameterized long convolutions and data controlled gating. Data controlled gating to me just smells like an LSTM, right? You have the gate and it's data controlled. And then you're using convolutions. I don't know, this is kind of. Recurrence of two efficient subquadratic primitives. They're calling them hyena filters. Oh shit, hyena filters parameterized by a feed forward network. Oh shit, so it's like some kind of mask on the attention mechanism that is parameterized by, an, by a multi layer perceptron. So you have an MLP that produces a mask. That's kind of badass. Okay, so these two papers, RWKV and Hyena, are actually kind of very similar. They're basically just attempts to make a, a different type of uh, transformer. They're like model architecture papers where they make slight variants of a transformer. So these two papers are basically the same. What about this one? Directly finding latent knowledge inside the internal activations in a purely unsupervised way. We introduce a method for accurately answering yes or no questions, giving only unlabeled model activations. latent knowledge this seems kind of weird this is just kind of like a inspection kind of paper generative data augmentation that's kind of a good idea right I think augmentation in LLM world is kind of under understudied to be honest I feel like you could there's probably all kinds of really interesting augmentation techniques that you could use to make uh, text data more robust and just a, just more variance m bigger distribution scaling laws for language models We tested whether larger open source models such as those from the OPT and LLAMA families are better at predicting brain responses recorded using fMRI.
Okay, so this is basically they're just going to take existing models and try to apply them to this weird specific problem. This could be cool, but... I really like this. This is regions of your brain, so this is activations in regions of your brain. We introduce a new framework for language model inference called Tree of Thoughts, which generalizes over the popular chain of thoughts approach to prompting and enables exploration over coherence units of text that service intermediate steps towards problem solving. TOT allows LMs to perform deliberate decision making by considering multiple different reasoning paths and self-evaluating choices to decide the next course of action, as well as look ahead or backtracking when necessary to make global choices. TOT significantly enhances the language model's problem-solving capabilities on three novel tasks requiring non-trivial planning and search, Game of 24, Creative Writing, Mini Crosswords. So this is almost like a cognitive architecture paper, which is cool, but I, I feel like just this stuff is going to change very, very quickly. Right, it's kind of like a Markov decision process for chain of thought, is my guess. Okay. And this one seems cool, but I think it's this is more of an engineering paper. Yeah, okay, I think this is the one. I feel like this is the paper. This fine tuning paper. And maybe this paper. This paper is gonna be fucking intense though. You guys better be ready. Look at this. <laughs> These papers are, this is no joke. <laughs> I'm going to need to drink a lot of coffee before this one. All right. I can probably do one of these too. But I'll leave you guys here. Uh, thanks for watching. See you guys tomorrow. Like and subscribe. Join the Discord. See you guys later. You guys have a great day.